Hi, and welcome to The Human Factor, the LinkedIn Live of Inc. and Fast Company. I'm Eric Schoenberg, the CEO of Inc. and Fast Company. The Inc. 5000 recognizes the fastest growing private companies that my colleagues at Inc. are able to identify. So Inc. 5000 founders are, by definition, some of the most successful entrepreneurs in America. Year after year, when we ask them what made them successful, about a quarter of them say, luck. Is that modesty? Well, today's guest would say they're probably right, and that people tend to underestimate the role of luck and success. Not blind luck, pure chance, but something more active, something like serendipity. Christian Bush directs the Global Economy Program at New York University's Center for Global Affairs and also teaches at the London School of Economics, where he earned his PhD. His latest research has led him to examine how successful people and thriving organizations make their own luck. The research has yielded a fascinating book, The Serendipity Mindset, The Art and Science of Creating Good Luck, which I highly recommend. Christian, we're lucky to have you here, or maybe just serendipitous. Welcome to The Human Factor. Thank you so much for having me, Eric. All right, Christian, let's define the terms. I tried to distinguish between blind luck and serendipity, but uh, I'm sorry I didn't cover the whole gamut. What is the difference? How, how would you define serendipity? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? Because if you look at luck, a lot of times we think about this blind luck, right? So in a way, being born into a loving family or all the kind of things we can't really influence. But serendipity is really about this kind of smart luck, this active luck that's all about saying there's people out there that just seem to have a little bit more luck than others, but they're really hard, working really hard for that. And so that's really what, what serendipity is about, is the ability to spot and connect dots and to uh, turn the unexpected into positive outcomes. So, and, and maybe as an example, right? I mean, if you picture that moment, if you have erratic hand movements like I do, and you're in a coffee shop, and, you know, imagine you spill coffee over someone, and, you know, you sense there might be some kind of connection. You don't know what it is, but you just sense there might be something there. And now you have a couple of options, right? Option number one is you just say, I'm so sorry. You walk outside and you think, ah, what could have happened had I spoken with a person? And option number two is you say, I'm so sorry. You start a conversation and that person turns out to become your co-founder, the love of your life, you name it. The point is our reaction to the unexpected, what we saw in the unexpected, in a way then leads us to the potential outcomes that could be. Uh, at some point, uh, you realized that in this distinction between pure chance and active luck, smart luck, there was a whole line of research and even a book at the end of it. What inspired you so much about this topic to lead you to the book? You know, it's interesting because serendipity is all about potentiality. It's, it's about what could be. And um, I had an experience early on in life. Uh, you know, I used to be this teenager who was kicked out of school, I had to repeat a year, and I transferred this uh, slight reckless, recklessness into, into my driving style, probably held the uh, unofficial world records of how many dustbins you can knock over on your way to school when you're driving. Mm -hmm. And then one day I wasn't so lucky anymore, and I crashed into four parked cars, and, and all cars were completely destroyed. And I won't forget the policeman who came to the scene, and he was like, oh my god, he's still alive. And so that idea that it was supposed to be dead, you know, that stuck with me and, and it brought up all these weird questions like, you know, what's the purpose of all of this? What's the meaning of life? And, and so on. I started reading this wonderful book, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And, you know, that's all about how do we find meaning in crisis? And what I realized during that journey is, you know, I love connecting people, connecting ideas and the spark that comes from that. And so on this journey then, you know, that resulted from that as entrepreneur, social entrepreneur and community builder, the most successful people, they somehow seem to have in common that they intuitively cultivate serendipity. And so that turned out to not only be something that I've observed then in my own life and with the people around me, but actually our research also showed, hey, the most purpose-driven, inspiring, successful people, they seem to have that in common. And so the idea was really to say, hey, there seems to be a science-based framework that we can develop to really understand how we can turn the unexpected into positive outcomes. Um, so successful people cultivate serendipity. I'm in the process right now of interviewing a, a number of successful people for a role here at Inc. and Fast Company. Um, and when I ask those people to describe their career arc to me, it's all very logical, very intentional, very kind of one step leads to another. Um, and I, I found myself thinking, heck, my, my career wasn't like that at all. It was kind of zigzag. Um, what's What's normal? 
You know, it's fascinating because in a way, we all in some way need this either illusion of control, right? That we think we can plan things out and that we always, you know, had everything under control. Or in a way, we have this kind of hindsight bias and post-rationalize and say, oh, yeah, like, you know, I did this and this in exactly this way. And I've always found that fascinating with CVs, right? That in a way, everyone does it. Like you, you present your CV as like step by step by step, but actually it was probably just you ran into someone at a conference, they told you about a new job, and that's how you ended up there. And, you know, in a way, if you think about this, that's what happens in boardrooms. That's what happens in team meetings all the time, right? That in a way we feel that leadership or that authority comes a lot from this idea that we can portray control and that we can know that this is what's going to happen this is how we're going to do it and you you go through that whole journey even though everyone knows that we don't always have everything under control and one of the key things that comes out of our research um, we've done a lot of work especially with with ceos around the question of how do you run a company in a world that is changing so fast that you just can't plan your strategy for the next 20 years or five years or two years or even one year. Um, and, and what is the way of how you can navigate this? And it turns out the most successful of them are really good at saying, hey, here's a sense of direction. Here's a North Star. You know, if I MasterCard, I want to bring 500 million people into the financial system so that they get access to financial resources and, you know, want to sell a couple of cards along those way. Um, and now I have my sense of direction. Here's my approximate strategy. But then I'm also having the openness to the unexpected, and that becomes part of the plan because innovation and everything else will come from the most unexpected of places. And, you know, I'm, I'm always a big fan, and Eric, I think we briefly talked about the example of the potato washing machine because the potato washing machine to me really comes to this idea of let's move away from the old school thinking, which is about we have to have it all mapped out, to we have to have a plan but also be um, uh, uh, able to, to, to navigate this. And so the potato washing machine, essentially, it's a company in China uh, that I've been doing some work with, and they got calls from farmers. And, you know, it's a refrigerator and, and washing machine company, white goods supplier and, and manufacturer, essentially. And they, you know, had like received calls from farmers and the farmers said, hey, your crappy washing machine is always breaking down. So they asked them, well, why is this washing machine breaking down? Well, we're trying to wash our potatoes in it and it doesn't seem to work. And, you know, the old school leadership approach would be to say, don't wash your potatoes in the washing machine. Our planning says that a washing machine is made for, you know, washing your clothes. They did the opposite. You know, they said, you know what, that's unexpected. But there's a lot of farmers in China who might have a similar problem. So why don't we build in a dirt filter and make it a potato washing machine? And that's how up to 50 percent of innovations and inventions emerge, right? That they are unexpected and people connect the dots and do something with it. <laughs> That's a great story. Uh, yeah, I'd forgotten about the potato washing machine. That's uh, one of many of the examples in your book, from post-it notes to Viagra to penicillin. Uh, there were all serendipitous discoveries that led to world-changing ideas, world-changing inventions. Exactly. Um, and the fascinating thing is, Eric, on exactly this point, that in a way, yeah. it's always the same process, right? And, and that comes to your earlier question, what do they all have in common? Like, they all have in common that it's not just something happening to us in terms of passiveness, but it's about, in the example of Viagra, it's, you know, people giving people medication against angina and researchers realizing, oh, there's some kind of movement happening in male participants' trousers. So instead of just ignoring this, well, hey, a lot of men might have a problem in that department, so why don't we make it a medication? So it's always this process of spotting the unexpected, connecting the dots and doing something with it. And the beauty then is that at every step of that process, we can influence it. We can seed more triggers, but also we can learn how to connect the dots more. Mm, all right, seeding triggers, connecting dots. I think we're moving into the, the techniques that you talk about in the book for creating uh, serendipity in your life, cultivating uh, an aptitude for for um, serendipity, or at least making the possibilities happen. So let's, why don't we kind of go through them? I, the one that one that you use to introduce the idea is cultivating an open mind. Uh, I, I think most people probably think they have an open mind. Uh, are they are they right? Well, you know, it's fascinating because I'm a big fan of this experiment just to to. Um, you know, showcase what, what that open mind idea really is about. Um, you know, in, in, in a lot of us assume that we're extremely open minded and, and, and that we see the unexpected, but actually we all have also a lot of biases, right? And one of our biggest biases, of course, is that we completely underestimate how likely it is that something unexpected happens because, you know, 
uh, life is exponential and and there's so many different things that could go wrong or right that we, we just can't 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 plan everything out and so i'm a big fan of this experiment um that's really showing that an open mind combined with the way we look at the world a lot of times frames how we then can go through the world and, and how much luck we can have and so in, in this one experiment they took one person who self-identifies as very lucky so someone who says good things tend to happen to me and and, and yada yada and someone who says uh, i'm very unlucky bad things tend to happen to me i'm always in accidents and and so on and then they tell both people walk down the street go into a coffee shop grab a coffee and sit down and then we'll have our interview for the research now what they don't tell them is that there's hidden cameras along the streets and inside the coffee shop there's a five pound note so money in front of the door of the coffee shop and inside the coffee shop the seat that's empty is next to this extremely successful businessman who can make big ideas happen now the lucky person walks down the street sees the five pound note picks it up goes inside the the shop orders the coffee sits next to the businessman they have a nice conversation exchange business cards potential opportunity coming out of it we don't know that part now the unlucky person walks down the street steps over the five pound note so doesn't see it goes inside orders the coffee also sits next to the businessman ignores the businessman and that's that now at the end of the day they ask both people hey how was your day today and so the lucky person says well it was amazing i found money in the street i made new friends and you know potential opportunity coming out of it the unlucky person just says well nothing really happened and the interesting thing here is that you know the second aspect yes that's also about do we engage people and we can talk more about this but you know closet introverts like myself for us it's always wonderful that a lot of things actually come out of like calm sources or silent sources it is you know like the, the money in the street type situation or taking another street to work and seeing a book in a bookstore and thinking oh my god we haven't talked about this for ages i should do a podcast about this so there's a lot of silent sources that serendipity comes from and it's really opening our mind to it and open our eyes to it and overcoming this idea that you know we can actually know everything or or control everything and, and i think that's the key open mind um to to in a way tackle our uh, underlying biases here um, in addition to an open mind, you talk a lot about a stimulated mind as being a, a fertile ground for serendipitous things happening. What do you mean by a, a stimulated mind and how do you make it happen? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? Because if you think about serendipity as connecting dots, like you want to see something in the moment, connect the dots, you need some kind of motivation for this. You need some kind of drive for this. And uh, Eric, we talked about this a lot. And I think, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed these, these, these wonderful conversations around um, uh, th this kind of question, especially in how do we find, you know, serendipity is about meaningful accidents. It's about imbuing meaning in something. And if I want to imbue meaning in something, the more I care about something, the more I'm excited about something, the more probable it is that I actually do that. And so if I work in a company that has a purpose, that wants to say lift X, Y, Z, hundred millions of people into the financial system, whatever it is, now I have more of an incentive to when I catch up with my uncle and my uncle tells me about this new technology that helps to lift people out of poverty to say, oh my God, such a coincidence. I'm working in a company that does that. Let me bring that to them. The point here is that the more we care about something, the more we feel that our individual purpose is aligned with an organization's purpose and so on, the more actually it is likely that serendipity happens because we actually have the motivation but more importantly, also people around us have the motivation because a lot of times serendipity is teamwork, right? Serendipity is maybe other people connecting the dots for us as well. And so um, the more we can provide this culture and this environment for um, motivation, the more uh, serendipity tends to happen. Um, there are um, uh, an, another important step, a, a, a couple of them are to seed triggers. What are triggers? You know, it's interesting because if you think about, so in the Viagra example, you know, movement in male participants' trousers, um, in the coffee shop examples, bumping into someone, or if you bump into someone at a conference or so on, there are those moments where we can make accidents meaningful. And that's kind of how a lot of serendipity happens. But what I'm actually even more fascinated by is the question of how do we, how do we create meaningful accidents ourselves? And so, um, you know, how do we create those meaningful triggers? And so to give you an example, I'm a big fan of, of the, the, the hook strategy. The hook strategy is uh, essentially saying, how can I put meaningful information out there that other people can pick up 
and then connect the dots with, being that content, being that in conversation or, or so on. To give an example, a very good friend of mine in London called Oli Barrett, uh, he's a wonderful entrepreneur. And if you would ask him, Oli, what do you do? So this dreaded question, you know, that they ask us at every conference or wherever we go, he would not only say, I'm, I'm a technology entrepreneur. He would say something like, I'm a technology entrepreneur, recently started researching the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. So what he's doing here is he's giving you three potential hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. I recently started hosting piano matinees. You should stop by. Oh my God, such a coincidence. My sister is teaching on the philosophy of science. You should give a guest lecture. Whatever it is, we can, we can seed that information so that other people can connect the dots uh, for us. And so I'm actually a big fan of uh, making a serendipity uh, journal where we write down what are the key themes at the moment that we're interested in. So in my case, for example, you know, I want to take the serendipity mindset into universities, into communities, into companies. And so I try to sprinkle that into every conversation. And like if we write down this idea that, hey, here is the kind of touch points, the kind of potential hooks that we can build into conversation without forcing it, then we leave other people the option to say, oh, my God, this is unexpectedly or expectedly relating to what I'm actually working on. And we can do the same with with very different uh, ways of, you know, content being that blog posts or or other ways, but essentially it's the idea of let's put something out there that could be a trigger point for other people to connect the dots. Um, it sounds like a, a lot of cultivating a, a, a serendipity kind of aura around yourself is about drawing out other people or putting yourself out there to um, so that there are the hooks for other people to connect the dots for you. Uh, one would conclude then that being an extrovert is kind of a, a very useful attribute for people who cultivate serendipity. Is that uh, the right conclusion? Can you be it's an introvert really and, and cultivate serendipity too? Yeah, well, it's really interesting because in a way, a lot of times when you look at effective teams, for example, you might have the kind of more extrovert person who goes out there, who connects with people. And then a lot of times the kind of more, you know, I mean, there are very reflective extroverts, but if I were to kind of try to um, put persona types out there, um, a lot of times they need that kind of more introvert type person to make sense out of that interaction with them, to help them filter, to work on, you know, developing that further with them. And so... A, the role of, of more introvert people a lot of times can be to, to complement more extrovert people in, in, in their actions. Uh, a second one also, um, and you know, I'm a closet introvert. I'm the kind of person, no problem speaking in front of people. And then after a speech, I'm like, okay, and now let me hide in the bathroom. I, like, I, I need to first kind of refresh and then I can speak with everyone individually again. And, and so for people like me, I've always looked for other ways how we can leverage extroverts in some way. Right. So, for example, is there a way where we could um, when we go to a party, first speak with the host about an idea and then the host for us, like talking with other people about the idea or, you know, ways where we can in a way understand how extroverts can can do part of, of the extroversion for us. But more importantly, and I think, um, Eric, that that's really also um, something that that I feel, um, you know, for introverts like 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 myself and others. Um, serendipity a lot of times comes really from these silent sources, right? It's about when we read a book and we say, oh my God, there's X, Y, Z, and this really relates to what my company is working on here. And so it's really also then about the, the ability to, to train ourselves to connect the dots and to, to do a lot of this analogous thinking of saying, oh, if I read something here, how can I connect this to something in another area? And then that's how a lot of serendipity emerges. So there's, there's a lot of hope for introverts. Um. You've used the phrase connect the dots a number of times in this conversation. Are some people uh, better at that than others? Uh, what makes you good at that? And if you're not good, how can you get better at it? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Lexi, my, my wonderful wife, who, 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 you, who do you know, um, uh, who's a wonderful dot connector and a wonderful, you know, people like her do that intuitively, right? People like her, she has a conversation with you, Eric, and she would say, oh my God, Eric, I should put you in touch with this person because coincidentally you've worked on the same thing. So, so, so to people like her, that comes very naturally. But what I found fascinating in this research is to say, okay, what can we learn from people like this in terms of what are the patterns behind this and how can we train ourselves to do more of this? And then it's, it's small behavioral shifts, right? So for example, um, one thing that, that I found very interesting is to say, okay, um, every conversation, think of one or two dots that you could connect. So when you have a conversation with your uncle's sister and you really didn't, or, 
or, or your your nephew or whoever, um, the person you really didn't want to like have that conversation now with, or the, the colleague you've talked about uh, the things for for the twentieth time now, and you feel bored at some point. In those kind of conversation, can you in a way interact in that conversation that you think, okay, whatever we talk about now, I want to make one introduction, or I want to connect like one idea of what they tell me with something else and once we kind of in a way get into that at the beginning it feels a bit artificial because you know it, it's weird to think about oh how can i provide value in in terms of like an introduction or something else but once we start training ourselves to see something in every situation we start doing that intuitively everywhere and and, and i think that's the fascination that this is not about saying we have to change everything, our whole mindset from one day to the other. This is about saying, how can we, by a small steps in a way, train ourselves to connect dots more, to see more in the moment, and then do something with that. And so there's a lot of practices around this that, that are effective, but I think the first one is really the easiest one I found is really to, in every interaction, just say, okay, is there something here that I can somehow imbue meaning into? Hmm. Um, a lot of our conversation up to this point has been about, personally um, becoming more open to serendipity. Can companies do this? Is this something that leaders, are, are there things that leaders can do to have a culture that is open to serendipity? Absolutely, and I think that's where it gets really excited and uh, exciting where in a way as, as leaders, we can do a lot to develop an environment for serendipity to happen. And there, there's, there's, you know, I think two major um, themes. One is really concrete practices, and the other one is working on the deeper kind of psychological underlying questions. And, and that's really around questions such as psychological safety and how do we provide an environment that motivates people to actually connect the dots. Um, but in terms of the practices, there's two that, you know, just to, to, to give you examples, uh, one mm -hmm. is, is, is around, um, you know, in, in a lot of companies, we have all these value statements. And um, some companies say, uh, one of our values is to be curious or to be XYZ, but then in the day-to-day -day meeting, you don't really see any of that. Like you don't see it implemented into the day-to-day -day practice. And so one simple way to integrate that is to say in the weekly meeting, one of the questions could be, what surprised you last week? Very simple question, but it essentially incentivizes people to look out for the unexpected. And if you're now the person who was called by the farmer and the farmer told me that they washed their potatoes in there, you might bring that up in the meeting and you might say, hey, you know what, now that you asked, I realized last week, yeah, these farmers, they were washing their potatoes. And you're like, oh my God, that might actually be something. So the point here is that we can use our day-to-day -day meetings and others to, to seed in those small questions around, you know, what surprised mm -hmm. you, what was unexpected, and, and really starting to question assumptions. And that's where a lot of the serendipity happens. But my favorite mm -hmm. uh, practice actually is the project funeral or the post-mortem. And so that is really based on this idea that in companies, a lot of times when something doesn't work, we try to hide it, right? We don't want to be the, the person, the loser who, who failed doing something. And so we, we try to hide that away. And the problem is we don't really learn from each other then, right? Because a lot of the real learning comes from things that don't work and 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 and, and a lot of the trust and a lot of the, the positive vulnerability, not the kind of oversharing, but the, the positive kind of connectedness with the other comes a lot from that idea of talking about things that don't necessarily work in a very productive way. And so the project funeral is all about saying, when something doesn't work out, the person who's responsible for it presents it in front of people from other divisions and talks about what they learned from why it didn't work. So it's not about celebrating failure, not at all. It's about celebrating the learning from what didn't work. And so in this one example uh, of a, a wonderful company I've been, I've been collaborating with, they have these um, window frames. And, and so the idea was, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, window frame and glass where the light doesn't properly reflect. And so it's, it's a wonderful technology. But the project leader said, look, we realized that we underestimated the market and, you know, people wouldn't pay as much as we thought. So we're putting it to rest now. We'll, we're putting it to rest and we learned that next time we'll do X, Y, Z differently. Now, someone in the audience goes like, hey, 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 have you considered what this would mean for solar? Have you considered if you would take that technology into a solar context, how much energy that could absorb. And that is how, quote unquote, coincidentally, part of their solar division emerged. The point here is those kind of practices, by definition, we can't know what exactly the unexpected positive outcome will be, but we can create an environment that makes it more likely that people connect the dots for each other. Uh, in my experience, uh, uh, you know, a, a post-mortem, uh, a project funeral can be a dangerous thing. It can lead to finger pointing and, and blame. How do you prevent that? 
That's an excellent question. I think that's exactly why I think a lot of this goes hand in hand with other practices. I think the, the project funeral comes at a point where you feel you have established a certain culture where people, you know, have a basic level of trust, where there's not this idea that this will be held against you, right? And um, which you have in a lot of companies. And I'm actually a big fan. I always do the water cooler test. You know, I, whenever I go to, to a company um, and I try to understand what is the culture here, um, I sit next to um, whatever the equivalent of the water cooler is, a cafeteria, a coffee shop, whatever. And then I pretend to work. But what I'm really doing is I'm listening to people's conversations. And that tells you a lot about the culture, right? And some companies, people would say something like, oh, you know, Peter again talked about this idea and it doesn't make sense. And oh, and he doesn't understand X, Y, Z. That's a culture where I certainly wouldn't recommend a project funeral at the beginning because we first need to build trust among people a bit more and, and, and really kind of establish a more productive frame. But then you have other companies um, where essentially you will have people come out of a meeting and say, oh my God, this was so interesting. I want to connect you with this person. I want to do this and this and this. And so I think to your point, it depends on the context in which we're doing it and where the team is at, at which point. And if it's a team where, you know, it's not yet quote unquote ready, I think practice is more around how do we develop a mutual purpose around something? How do we rally around something together? Um, at the beginning is much more important to, to first establish this common denominator. Okay, good. Create a, a safe environment for, for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I get a general picture of, uh, of a person who is open to serendipity, kind of going through life with um, a, a great deal of flexibility uh, and never having set decisions, or at least not closing off avenues and being open to all options. But at some point, it seems to me that serendipity is probably not the approach that you want to take at a particular stage of um, your career or of a project. Is there a time when you don't want you don't want to be in search of serendipity? You want to do something else? Absolutely, and very often actually, because uh, you know I had that recently happen with a book, right? Like at the beginning, it was like great. You know, give me all the unexpected ideas and let me have all these unexpected conversations with people who could be, you know, somehow involved with the book in some way or some kind of content, whatever it is. And then once I knew what I wanted to do, it was execution mode, right? It was like focus and like no other things. And then serendipity would would partly be distracted, right? And so um, I, I'm always a big fan of this kind of funnel approach and, and really saying, you know, being at a project, right, which maybe starts explorative phase and then goes into um, the kind of more exploitation slash execution phase um, in our lives, right? Sometimes in our lives, we have an extreme openness when we're in periods of transition. That's why in transition, we grow so much, right? Because we're extremely open to all these things versus if we just have a new job and, and we really want to kind of show that we can do it, and we're in execution mode. So I think it, it definitely depends on the context. And I think it's a lot of question around filters, right? How do we build good filters? Um, for example, having a certain North Star as a company, right? So knowing approximately where we're going so we're, that we connect the dots always to that particular North Star or as an individual, what are some of the core values that are important at which point, what are some of the key interests at the moment? So I'm a big fan actually of, of developing that sense of direction that helps us focus whatever serendipity happens and also being selective in terms of what kind of groups or, or people to interact with at, at which point in time um, when we have to focus. Um that's an important point about uh, about having a north star that uh, knowing where you're going and kind of what the goal is it is related i think to what you were saying about having a stimulated mind and being excited about something that just kind of makes certain dots stand out in in uh, relief uh compared to others and and helps you connect them talk a little bit about uh, about north star what are what are good examples from companies that you've researched that have North stars that kind of breed a, a serendipitous environment. Yeah, well, it's interesting because one of the the companies I've been doing a lot of work with is is Mastercard, and I think they've been very interesting because they, in a way, have you know they used to be essentially a credit card company, right, or like financial transaction company, and they developed an amazing core capacity there. But, you know, if you're an employee now, if you're someone who wants to get excited about these kind of things, it's like, yeah, OK, it's fine. It's OK. But, but you know, it, it might not necessarily be the kind of bigger purpose you're, you're looking for in a company versus now, you know, at some point, the, the, the then CEO said, hey, look, like there's a couple of really big problems here in the world. And those problems might be defined by uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals or in other ways. But the point is, 
if I see that there's a big societal question and a big societal issue here, so in this case, societal exclusion of you know hundreds of millions of people who didn't have access to the financial system, if I now can say as a CEO, okay, I have my core capabilities here, which is financial transactions and so on. I know that hundreds of millions of people don't have access to a financial system. Can I, can I be the bridge here? And can I help our focus go into a direction that combines our you know, core competencies, the way we make money, everything else, with the idea of we have actually something we can work towards and rally people around. And I found that fascinating because in a lot of the companies I've been working with, it's really a lot of times saying, where are we at the moment? And how do we either modernize our legacy? So look back and say, why are we here in the first place? What is, why, why does it matter that we're here? Did we lose like our soul? Did we get so focused on like just making money? So either kind of modernizing that legacy or um, more importantly, looking at the SDGs or other ways and then really um, making that bridge to it. And I think though, Eric, being honest, the biggest challenge I've seen um, working with companies is that they, a lot of times, do that first step, right? Where then the CEO is on board, maybe the board is on board, but then it doesn't really trickle down. Like if I'm the employee mm -hmm. and I come into the office on Monday morning, it doesn't feel that I'm really working towards this in everything I do. And so I think it's extremely important to develop, uh, you know, and integrate that into every practice, performance reviews, um, promotion processes, hiring processes, to really make sure that everything we're doing, the related values and the related purpose is integrated across the organization. Otherwise, it's just lip service and nobody believes it. And then I think that's when trust gets lost. Mm. Ah, that is, uh, that's an important point. Um, there's, a, there's a quote in the book from the Guardian columnist and social psychologist Oliver Berkman, which I thought was an interesting framing of the question of serendipity. He said, um, uh, or he said, uh, as, as you quoted him, uh, something like, the most important thing in life is to recognize that everybody is winging it all the time. <laughs> Why did that resonate with you? You know, it resonates so deeply both, you know, in my personal life, but also in a lot of the research. And, and you know, I'm sure, Eric, I mean, every high powered person I meet after the third glass of red wine will say, oh my God, you know, you know, I had to show that I have everything under control, but actually I don't always have everything under control. And that's fine, right? That's fine. Like every doctor, like even in those positions and those roles where we think, oh, they will always have everything under control, right? The doctor, the pilot, like we want them to always have everything under control, but sometimes they have to wing it. And in those moments, actually, that's where the real difference happens, right? That's where in like the case of a, co of a, of a pilot, it's, it's, it's life or death. But in our day-to-day -day life, it's just like, okay, we just need to navigate this. I'm a new parent soon, you know? Uh, parenting, I guess, is, is all about, right? Like trying to figure out like <laughs> how do you approximately raise a wonderful child, but then also get ready for the unexpected. And so I think, uh, Eric, to, to this point, it's really this this idea. And I, I, I try to communicate that a lot, especially to my students, because I think they go out there and they feel so much pressure because they think, oh, I have to, I know, have to know this and this and this. And then we have that conversation say, hey, look, you do your best to get as much knowledge in this and this as you can, but more importantly, start asking the right questions and, and start going out there with an open mind. And usually then life will work out in some way. And most people are, are winging it at some point, and that's fine. And if you're winging it at some point, it's more important for you to build a muscle for this than to just always feel, you know, oh, my plan is, isn't working out. And I think that's the bit, bigger psychological idea really behind this serendipity mindset to say, you know what? We try to plan as much as we can. Me as a German, I love planning, right? But then also we're building in this idea, the unexpected can become an ally and it's part of the plan. And then it gives us less anxiety. Are you a lucky guy? I consider myself to be very lucky, both blind luck and, and a little bit of the kind of serendipitous luck uh, coming together probably, yeah. Well, um, you certainly sound like it. And, um, um... This has been fascinating, Christian, and uh, the research is amazing and so practical and so applicable to uh, ordinary life as well as business settings. And just one more question is, um, we've been talking now for half an hour. Have you been winging it? <laughs> I mean, constantly, I guess, in terms of, <laughs> but you know, Eric, it's so fascinating. I had that conversation a few days ago with a, with a good friend of mine about how, in a way, how do we, do we really always practice what we preach? And I realized I'm not always practicing what I preach. I mean, I had COVID last year 
And, you know, uh, it was a really bad period. And for the first weeks, it was such an emotional feeling, right, that I really had to remind myself, okay, Christian, it's about perspective taking now. It's about taking yourself out of this moment. It's about trying to see, is there still some kind of meaning in there? I reread Viktor Frankl's Search for Meaning, right, because it's, it really kind of reminds you of how to still find meaning in that situation. But so to your point, I'm certainly uh, winging it quite often. And, and, and certainly um, I have more questions than answers in, in most areas of life. Well, that's a great way to go through life and certainly means that you're open to those serendipitous opportunities when they arise. Christian, thank you for being on the show. Uh, this has really here. been interesting. Um, and thanks to, uh, to uh, Scott Mebus behind the camera, to Kathleen Bianello, Emma Gordon, and Rose Levy, the producers of The Human Factor. And thanks for watching. This has been The Human Factor, and I'm Eric Schoenberg. Thank you.